Hi there, everybody. Welcome to the IHM Football Academy webinar. We've got a really interesting presentation for you this afternoon, and I'll soon be introducing the hosts today, and uh, then we'll get started. We're just going to wait a little while to make sure everybody's here who wants to watch. So just bear with us for a second. However, today leading the presentation is my colleague Mick. Mick Brennan is the director of IHM Football Academy. And Mick and I were the founder members of the, uh, the company and the school and the academy. And then today we're lucky to have Gary McIndoe from Latitude Law. Gary's the MD of Latitude Law in Manchester. And Gary's law firm specializes in immigration law. And one of Gary's colleagues prepared the research report that we've based our presentation on today. And we can't wait to share that with you later on. And at the end of the presentation, you'll be able to type questions into the Q&A at the bottom bar of the screen there. And Gary and Mick will be able to take questions from you at the end. So just a few more people joining us right now. That's great. Welcome, everybody. We're really happy that football training is back on in the UK now, and we're already making preparations for reopening the Football Academy on Monday, the 7th of September. So exciting times. And we, we know that all our players won't be able to wait to get back into training. So let's see. I think possibly, Mick, we could get started now. Um, I've got the whole thing to be able to share that, Peter. Not a problem. There we go. Super. Okay, guys. Um, well, welcome to uh, this webinar. Um, in a moment or so, I'm going to um, share my screen with a PowerPoint presentation. Um, it's great to see you all uh, here online. I can see from the list of people who are attending, we've got some of our players, our up and coming players um, that are joining us, which is great. And hopefully some players that are thinking of joining us and just want more information about what we're talking about. So I'm going to share my screen now. I've got a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to um, run through with you all and I'll talk through and give you uh, more information on each slide. Hopefully, uh, you can all see that PowerPoint uh, just come up now on your screen. Uh, Peter says, at the end of um, this, we will take some questions. There is a Q&A bar uh, on this uh, um, webinar so for you to be able to uh, put in your questions in there and we will try our best to answer them. Um, hopefully, as we go through, we can answer most of, of your questions. So. What is the webinar about? Well, it's where in the world um, I can play as a player, where you can play as a player. And we're going to be looking at those most welcoming league, football leagues for uh, non-UK and EU citizens. So I'll give you a brief overview of what we're going to try and cover uh, today in this webinar. So we're going to touch on becoming a professional footballer. Now, we're not going to go through that as if this is the rules, this is what you have to do. Because we've just got a couple of slides giving some outlines of becoming a professional footballer. Because ultimately, we know that um, most of the players that come to our programmes, that is their aim, that is their goal. Okay, so we're going to touch on it. And we've got other webinars and other sessions, especially for those of you that are looking at coming onto the programme this coming season. We've prepared more um, uh, information about how to help and guide you on that. Okay. We're then going to look at the challenges in the UK for progression as a uh, player for those players who are non-UK and non-EU. And there's a number of challenges which, which many of us may not be aware of. We're going to touch on the UK football pyramid. Um, really important that you understand uh, the football pyramid here in the UK or wherever you're looking at uh, playing. So we're just going to touch on that briefly. Then we will get into where else in the world. And we labelled it as where else in the world. So where else from rather than here in the UK could you play? And the things, that the list of things based on the study that, that Gary's uh, team there have put together, 
um, that we need to consider. And there's a number of things that, as Peter said right at the start, we've been um, here with the Academy, we were founders of the Academy um, some 14 years ago, um, and it's developed and changed, but there's still some things in there that until this study came through, that we didn't even consider for non-EU and non-UK players as well. So it's really important information. We're going to look, we will tell, we'll give you a breakdown of those friendly countries. Um, we're going to look at the US scholarship route. We're going to touch on that. And I know that there's um, some of you here online that are already in that um, process, which is fantastic. And you might be able to comment um, in the Q&As at the end about your experience going through that process and what you hope to achieve from it. We'll touch on the virtual showcase um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, our virtual showcase and that virtual showcase was something that was put together um, for this current time where many of you can't be out and play football and we couldn't run an actual physical showcase here in the UK so we put that together but in actual fact that's now becoming more prominent based on this um, research. And then we'll finish with the Q&A and we'll answer as many questions as we can, um, as honest as we can for you all. So let's move on. As we go through, you'll see a few of the pictures that will flick up of players. Um, it gives you a background and it gives you some images. These are from a couple of seasons ago of our players. Um, but as we start, becoming a professional footballer. Now, before we, we go through these points, um, if I could give you the recipe of being a professional footballer and say, well, there you go, that's exactly what you need to do to be a professional footballer and you'll be a professional footballer, then we wouldn't all be sat here looking at this presentation because we'd be multimillionaires if we could just wave a magic wand and say you're all going to be a professional footballer. Okay, so these are guides. These are things that we are there to help you and advise you and, and guide you through. But a few key pointers, okay? Firstly, some things that you need to understand is that only a small percentage of players make it to that professional football. When, you, when we look later on at the football pyramid, you see the amount of players that are actually playing football that funnel through to that top level football. So it's really difficult. That's not to say that if you have the passion and the drive and the ability and everything like that, you can't make it. But there are only a small percentage of players that do make it. Working towards being a footballer is a way of life. Um, and if that is what you're starting to do, whatever your, your, your age is now, if you're, you're watching this now, um, and that's what you want to do, it's a way of life. And you need to be starting that way of life and starting that process and starting that mindset right now. We've got um, a great class session that uh, um, coaches, um, Sir David Raven has put together. David is um, our head coach at Ellesmere. And he's an ex-Liverpool player, um, and he currently still plays. He still plays semi-professional. Uh, he's got a Champions League winner's medal. Um, and he's put, us, put together a great uh, PowerPoint about being a professional footballer and, and what that takes. So that, that goes into more in-depth. And I think we'll look at having that uh, webinar um, very soon. OK, you've got to be prepared to work hard and make sacrifices. None of those players that you see out there, your Ronaldos and your Roonies and Messis, none of them had it handed to them on a plate. Yes, they have ability and they've got lots of, lots of attributes, but they've had to work hard and they still work hard every single day to progress on. Making sacrifices is, is you know, as a, a player um, and as a young player, you might want to be out ends out and around around town but sometimes you might have to say to them actually no I've got a game tomorrow morning so I'm not going to be doing that I'm not going to go to that party I'm not going to be having that takeaway that you're having all them things so there's sacrifices you have to make and, and sometimes the big sacrifices take every opportunity however small however small it may be if you're if, if you're given the opportunity to get your foot in the door playing football take it because every opportunity that comes along, you need to grab it to move up that ladder as you're going. Okay, so whether that is a, a, a trial at a club that you don't want to go and trial at, but you never know who you might get in front of. Remain motivated, and that's the hardest thing to do, um, especially if you're going through the academies. You know, we've got we've got people here on the webinar that've been on our academy um, two years, maybe coming up to three years. Um, and it can be difficult if you go through that time and you've not broken into a first team, you've not managed to be seen by a scout, but you've got to, if that's genuinely what you want to do, you've got to remain motivated and get picked up and get picked up from, from the knockdowns. Be confident in everything that you do. 
Okay, you, you look at these footballers, um, the professional footballers out there, they, they have confidence. They have confidence when they're being interviewed. They have confidence when they're got, stepping out on the pitch. And enjoy it. One of the things, we, we were asked a question doing this, um, uh, I think it was two weeks ago. Um, and one of the questions was, what's the main thing that I need? What, what is the main attribute uh, to be able to progress on? Or what's the main thing I need to think about to be, being a professional footballer? And the main thing I said is enjoy it. Because if you're not enjoying it, then you're doing the wrong thing. You're going in the wrong direction. A few more things. You need dedication on and off the pitch. So not just when you turn up on the pitch and you've got your favourite coach and somebody that, that, that you like and enjoy being with. It's off the pitch, how you conduct yourself off the pitch and around the players. It's also having that dedication, even when you don't really feel like it or when you've got that coach that potentially you don't really gel with, but still having that dedication and that drive. Understand the game and never stop learning. Um, and you, you're trying to do that now. You're on a webinar where you're looking at where in the world can I play. You're trying to understand, which is fantastic, and it's a great step. But you can always pick something up. So from any session, any, any information like this, you can always pick something up. If you go into a coaching session, for example, on the pitch, and it's the same session that you might have done a couple of weeks ago, and you might think, oh, well, we did this a couple of weeks ago. You should still be able to get in and, 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 and pick something up and learn something from that, um, uh, from that session and understand the game. And that might be understanding the game in the UK and understanding the game in, in other countries. We've said about making sacrifices. Um, a lot of the players that, are, um, that come on our academies do that. They step up and they're making sacrifices. They're doing that by travelling halfway around the world um, to pursue their dream of... of becoming a footballer and follow the education route, which is great. Um, but you've got to be prepared to make them sacrifices as you go through. Okay. Be the best you can all the time. You never know who's watching. This is something that we say all the time to our players. Um, when you step out on that pitch or even before them, when you turn up um, a, a training session or a trial, you never know who's watching or who's there or who's listening. So make sure that all the time you can be the best you can. Um, I was at a, a trial session. There's lots of different trial sessions. Like we run our, our showcase event, which we'll talk a little bit about at the end of this presentation. Um, but I was at one of those sessions once and I was talking to one of the scouts and he was telling me quite often, if, if he turns up at one of those sessions or he turns up somewhere, he'll know the player that he needs to focus on and look at before he's even got to the pitch when he gets out of his car on the car park and he shuts the door he can hear who's commanding who's loud on the pitch okay sometimes he knows by the time when he goes into the um venue who comes up and says hello who comes up and greets him does some of the players does some of the players come up and shake his hand and greet him and help him so he knows before sometimes he gets on the pitch so be the best you can all the time on and off the pitch and then the four A's, and this is something that um, uh, we go by, um, that players should have as standard. Um, and we've got a great video as well that'll be coming out soon that our head coaches, um, Matt and Dave, put together yesterday about um, their standards and their minimum standards um, and, and non-negotiables, I think they called it, of what, what they see players um, on our academy, but realistically, anywhere as they're progressing on in football should really have. But... These four A's, these didn't come from me or, or from us. We've not magic these up. This has come from one of the Manchester United scouts. Um, he wasn't at Manchester United when he, when he put this together. He was at, at Ball and Wonders and we used to work with him. And he moved to another club and he stuck by this. And he, he's still at Manchester United and he still sticks by this of the four A's that he looks for in a player, a standard. So have they got a good attitude? So have you got a good attitude to everything that you do? Everything that we've just said, dedication on and off the pitch and dedication to learn, that, that attitude. Are you an athlete? And when you look at some of these players, you look at Ronaldo, he's an athlete. Yes, he's a fantastic football player, but he's also an athlete. So any athlete in running and moving and jumping and everything like that, he could give them a real good run for their money. So he's an athlete. Have you got ambition? Have you got that drive to want to progress on? Are you showing that? Are you working on everything of your game on and off the pitch? And then if you've got the ability, you know, you need the ability. But in actual fact, them four A's, and every time I've spoken to him, 
And before eight, he's always that last one. He looks for everything else, the attitude, the athleticism, the ambition, before he looks at that ability. Because quite often the ability, if you've got some raw, raw talent, some raw ability, as coaches, as clubs, they can, they can coach you on that. But if you haven't got the attitude, or you're not an athlete, and you're not ambitious, quite often they can't coach you on that. So they're things that you need to be thinking about and need to be, um, be looking at. So that's just two slides of a brief overview. We've got more that we can look at. There's loads more that you can look at of becoming a professional footballer. There's some standards and some basics to look at. Now, <clears throat> as we progress on then through this presentation, the, the reason for this webinar today is looking at where in the world can you play? And the reason that we've got this together is because um, there are challenges in the UK uh, for progression for non-UK and EU players. And in actual fact, this will potentially apply, and we can we can check actually um, towards the end when we when we speak we we'll do the Q and A, and we can ask Gary on that. But it'll apply to the EU players um, uh, too from from January when the UK officially leaves the EU. So what are some of those challenges? Well, there's the visa, and there's work uh, permit restrictions. So if you're coming into the UK, even if you're coming into the UK on a student visitor visa or, or a tier four visa, there's often um, restrictions on what you can do, what, how much you can work, how much you could earn, um, and whether you can play professional sports. Um, so there's restrictions with visas and work permits when you come into the UK, and quite often that will prevent you playing at a, at a good level here in the UK. Article 19 of the FA rules, and we're not going to go through that in loads of detail, but the FA rules, which are separate to visa rules and, and to immigration rules, but the Football Association rules also can prevent players play, um, signing for clubs. So Article 19 mainly looks at the under-18s and signing for academy clubs. And within reason, other than a few... Um, boundaries that, that can be be looked at it will prevent players from signing for professional clubs and we've had that we've had players that are on our academy that have gone to good professional clubs and they've said to us what's the visa status actually if they're not a, a eu or uk player under article 19 we're not allowed to sign them okay governing Body endorsement. So that is the governing body of the sport, so the FA, okay, and a points-based system for you to be coming in and getting a work permit and being able to, to be given the permission to play. So that points-based system will have a whole host of different things to create the points, but the major things that they look at are representation of national side. And that's what they look at to see if players can come in, non-UK and EU players can come in and, and play in the English football system. And when they're looking at that, they're looking at FIFA ranked national sides. And as well as representing your national side, potentially you will have had to play a percentage number of games for your national side. So they're just underneath where I've got that. And we've got up some percentages. So if, the, if your country um, is ranked 1 to 10 in the FIFA rankings, Potentially, you would have had to play 30% or above for your national side at your age and your, your level to be able to start to get the points on that points-based system. And then, as you can see, it goes, goes down and through. And I think it goes up to FIFA ranking up to 70. OK, so there, there are things that you need to be thinking. And we have to be realistic as players and we have to be real, realistic as an academy rather than misleading anybody and saying, if you're not at that level, if you're not representing your national side, are you going to be able to sign for a, a, a top professional club in the UK? It's going to be very difficult. So we said about learning the game and understanding the game and understanding the systems of football. So I'm just going to touch a little bit on the football pyramid um, here. Uh, many of you may know it, but this is the football pyramid here in the UK. Um, and we put it like a pyramid such as that because... When you look down there at the bottom, there are thousands and tens of thousands of players playing in them non-league, underneath that non-league thing, who are all striving to progress on and get up that football pyramid. So there's another challenge there, as well as visas, as well as uh, work permits, you're battling with other players as well, as you are in any country and everything that you're doing. And that's where I'm saying that a small percentage of players make it. 
But we have steps one to four, and that is what is seen as our league football. That is seen as professional football, okay? Now, in the non-league in steps five, and sometimes in step six there, there are still some sides that have gone professional that have gone full-time. When we break down past that in the non-league, they're semi-professional or they're amateur football clubs um, and potentially, and I'm just going to move it on. So you've got, in the professional, you've got Premier League Championship, League One and League Two, as many of you will know. If we go down into that um, non-league, so this is the non-league um, side or um, part of that pyramid. So steps five to six, there are still some full-time teams in there. But seven, eight, and nine, and going further down, sometimes for um, overseas players, there are opportunities to get into them non-league. And as we were saying further back in this presentation, players should take every single opportunity. When you look at some of the professional players, and albeit they are UK players, um, but when you look at some professional players, such as um, Ian Wright, one of the old players, he started, he was playing in the non-league system until he was about 22, I think actually a bit older than that, and didn't get picked up by Crystal Palace until he was well into his 20s. He started playing professional then um, and ended up playing at Arsenal and he's an FA Cup winner and he played for England and, and was successful. Um, you've got Jamie Vardy who did exactly the same. He was playing non-league um, and got picked up by Fleetwood and then he moved up the ranks to, to Leicester and he's got a Premier League winning um, medal and he's been representing England. So it's an opportunity to get your foot in the door. So when we get a lot of players that come to us and say, well, I don't want to play there, I want to go right to professional, that's where we have to say, well, actually, if you can get your foot in the door at non-league, and that you just never know where that may take you, especially if you manage to play if you are a non-EU and non-UK citizen and you manage to get into that non-league, you may be able to move up through the ranks. It is still very difficult um, with visas and work permits. So, all that considered, where in the world can I play? Okay, that is the question that we are, are looking at and the things that we need to consider. Okay, so we've said about work um, permits and visas and the requirements in, that, in the particular countries. One thing that you need to consider is the permitted foreign players in a squad. And this is something that, that possibly we didn't really pick up on. But some countries um, and some leagues limit the number of foreign players a team can have in their squad. And if you think about that, um, and you are looking to go into a country or into a league to play, and they have a limit on the number of foreign players in that squad, then they're limiting your opportunities for getting into squads and for getting into teams. OK, so that limits where, what, what you can do. Along, along the same lines as that is a limit of foreign players playing in the starting 11. Some countries, some leagues have a limit. So um, and we'll see on a table later on. Some have, you can only start three players in the, in the starting 11. So you're already limited there as to how far you can progress on. And what will that will, may also mean is that's a barrier because quite often, when scouts are looking, they're looking at what spaces they've got in squads, okay? Not only what positions do they need to fill, but what spaces um, they've got to fill within their squad. And this agreement, Cotono agreement, I think it is, okay? I may have said that wrong. Now, this is something to take into place, something we didn't consider. Um, so this agreement, to give you a little bit of an overview, is um, an agreement between the EU and the ACP countries, so African, Caribbean and Pacific countries. And as a very brief overview on that um, agreement, what that means is that the non-EU players from them three categories of countries have to be classed and categorised and um, have the same rights as the EU players, or work. it, it, it comes under um, working restrictions. So when we're looking at that per permitted foreign players, they have to be seen in the same light as an EU player. So if you're a foreign player and that agreement is in place, then you are seen as an EU player. So again, that takes that barrier away. And also the league of the country, um, the, the status of football in that country, in that league, okay? You want to be somewhere where football is prominent and where it is good for your development. And that is why we get so many players looking at coming into the UK 
to play football because we have the Premier League and we have the home of football and budding and, and, and the development of football, which is still right, which is still great. And I would still say that here in the UK for development of football and knowledge of football, when you look at the coaches, just not, not only the coaches that we have, but the coaches in the UK um, developing football, it's still the place to develop. But then to progress on sometimes to that next level, you might have to go somewhere else first. So we break, break this down now. We look at these friendly countries. So as part of this, um, as we said right at the start, um, we had a study commissioned by um, Gary and his team at uh, Latitude Law um, to look at the restrictions and the accessibility of uh, European football and for, non, for, for foreign players coming into Europe to play. And this study is just from March this year. So it's just before the lockdown is when we got the study. Okay. So... From this study, and um, looking at those at those things that we just look, we're looking at the number of foreign players that can play in the starting eleven and visas and so on and so forth. We've broken it down into two groups. So group one and group two of what we see as the friendly countries. So we've got Belgium. So in Belgium, and we I'm going to talk about these individually as we go through. We've got Denmark. We've got Germany. And we've got Portugal. So four countries there that when we look at the prominence and the status in world football are up there near the top. OK, you've got Belgium. I think Belgium is still ranked first in the world. And then we've got a second group of, of countries that may have some restrictions, but are still quite player friendly. We've got Croatia, the Czech Republic and Hungary. So that, they're the prominent ones that have come out of this study, the ones that we are going to be focusing on uh, going forward. Um, but they're the prominent ones that have come out of this study. So when we look at just that group one that we were talking about, and we put a bit of a comparison table together here, okay, you can see, and I, I've, I'm comparing them four in the lighter shade at the top to England or the UK, Italy and Spain. And why am I comparing them to them three? Well, when we get players coming to us, they're, that's the places that they want to play. They want to play in the UK. They want to play in the Premier League. They want to play in Italy in the league. They want to play in Spain because they are seen as, as the pinnacles of football. But in actual fact, in all three of those, there's lots of barriers for um, foreign players. Okay. And different types of barriers. And you can see for yourself um, what them barriers can be. So in, in England, it's the uh, work permit and the visas. Um, in Italy and Spain, it's the maximum number of foreign players at the club. There's only three, and there's only three allowed in the starting eleven. So, again, you narrow it down to, to where you can go. Okay, But when you look at Belgium and Denmark and Germany, then barriers come down. We're going to look at those in a little bit more detail now. So, in Belgium... There's no work permit required. You may need a visa, and I think we can. Uh, I think that is a Schengen visa that you would need um, for, for most of these countries, which is um, process is slightly easier to get. But there's no work permit required to play. There's no maximum of foreign players in the squad. Um, there's no maximum of foreign players in the starting eleven. And in 2016, 56% um, of their first first division players were foreign players um, and there's evidence there that obviously these businesses they are investing in these clubs um, and they are recruiting uh, from overseas so as you can see here an entrepreneur South Korean entrepreneur he owns a Belgian club and his particular aim is to build bridges between Europe and European players and young Korean Japanese Chinese players um, and put them on that platform in, in, in Europe We move on to Denmark. So again, work permit, no work permit required. There's no maximum of for, uh, foreign players in the squad. There's no maximum in the starting 11. Uh, a particular, as an example here, FC Helsinger, uh, they actively promote themselves as a haven for foreign players. Um, it is English speaking. Um, and this was a quote here from the owner of that club, that there is a culture of playing young players there. I mean, you see 17, 18, 19 year olds playing in first teams in the in the Super League of the first division. And it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in, 
elsewhere. We see sometimes here in the UK, young players coming through, but them young players coming through are often UK or EU citizens. You don't see um, overseas players coming through at that really young age now. Germany. So no work permit required there in Germany. There's no maximum uh, foreign players. Uh, no maximum in the starting 11. Uh, something that's interesting in Germany, there's no squad size limits. In some leagues around the world, um, there is a maximum of the number of players that you can have in your squad. But in Germany, there isn't. So they can keep enrolling players. They can keep taking on players. As long as they've got the funds to do so, they can keep taking them on. Then in Portugal, again, work permit, there is no work permit required. There's no maximum of foreign players. There's no maximum uh, in starting 11. Um, and South Americans thrive here. So Brazilian players made up 25% um, of the players in the top league in Portugal in 2017. So we move on. So that is, that, that's just four of those countries that we've recognised that are going to be player friendly countries so when you're progressing on from your wherever you're playing currently and when you're wanting to move on that's what we will start to work with some of our players um on and that is what possibly you should be looking at and, and are you looking in them right places another option for um overseas players is a u.s scholarship and i know that there's a few of you on here that are looking at this route um, so the u.s scholarship what does it offer well it offers playing in stadiums all right, so you're going to do your education, you're going to do your university study. It gets part funded if you get the scholarship, if you've got the ability either academically or on the pitch. But you get to play in stadiums. And some of these stadiums are bigger than some of the Premier League stadiums and the league football stadiums here in the UK. You work towards your degree. And many of you that have been on some of our webinars or been on the program here or, or know about research what we do we're about football and education and having that education um, is really important so to have that backup of the degree um, for future for when you're playing career you know the playing career of, of a player on average it was interesting from that um, information that I was looking through with David earlier this week playing career um, at the top, when you can be earning for, for a professional player, on average, can only be about seven years, six, seven, eight years. So you need something else to fall back on. And it's only a small percentage, again, that will make enough in them short years to be able to live once they've retired or had to stop playing. But also there's that thing of if you get injured at any point along the way. So you get to earn your degree. Fantastic facilities. The facilities are, are, are top notch in the US, as everything, because everything has to be bigger and better. Um, you build a network of contacts, not only with your players, but with coaches um, and with teams out there in the US. The destinations are fantastic. So, what happens? We work with Soccer Assist. Um, <clears throat> and what Soccer Assist will do for, for players is they will get a range of offers um, for, for players. And you then get to choose your destination. You get to have a look and research what your destination is. And that range of offers can vary. The number of offers can vary depending on your ability um, and your drive and your ambition to, to progress on. You get your life skills and it's fantastic for your CV. So Tyrell, who we work with, he took this route um, and from it, he managed to get on to, I think it was um, Sweden or Switzerland to play professional. And a lot of the colleges in the US are part of the MLS drafting system. The MLS, the, the Major League Soccer is becoming very big uh, now. So um, it's part of the drafting system. So the players have got a, a natural route through into there. So based on all this study and based on what we're telling you today, what are we doing at the academy and our future pathways and how has it changed our mindset? Well, everything that we do with regards to our training, our development and supporting players will, will remain the same. We'll continue to improve and develop on that. But what we will also be doing is we'll be looking at developing links with clubs in these highlighted leagues. Um, so looking at that group one and group two highlighted leagues, we've already got a few of those links, but we'll now be focusing on that a little bit more because that is a more realistic route. 
Okay, we'll be developing some more links with the UK non-league clubs. Um, so if that is a route that we can we can get some players through, we'll be doing that. We're going to continue to work closely with IPSO. IPSO is the International Professional Scouting Organisation um, and their network of scouts around the world. And if you take a look at their website, they train scouts around the world. They're training them how to scout players. And they go all around the world. So you can look on their website, see all the destinations that they work with and what their network of scouts is. So we need to use that more to try and get our, our players seen by their network of scouts. We're going to work closely with Soccer Assist and the US opportunities because it's a real opportunity for progression for many of our players. And as I say on here, I know that we've got a few on here who have either been through the presentation, have spoken to them or are working through that currently. And we're going to continue to be open and honest um, with our communication to players and parents and agents. Okay, We don't want to mislead any players as they're going through their pathway. We want to be honest and try and help and support players to progress on. So what are some of those opportunities and how now does that link in to what we deliver here? And things that maybe you need to look at when you're looking at football academies, wherever they be, um, whether here in the UK or around the world. Well, the showcase event. We, we're going to have international scouts through IPSO attending our showcase events and through some of the contacts that we've got. And also with that, we're going to expand it out to our virtual showcase event, which we'll speak about towards the end. Um, our regular games, again, every time we play is an opportunity. So if we've got travelling teams coming over, we've got, um, we've got other coaches coming, um, they're always an opportunity. Every time, like we said at the start, every time you step over the line, um, it's an opportunity. The US scholarship route that we've spoken about and working closely with Tyrell there and our guest coaches coming in. And, and every time you, you get a new pair of eyes coming in to watch you as a player, that is an opportunity. Um, and then our partnership there with Ipso, uh, we're going to try and develop that in our scouts across Europe. So we have a few success stories on here, just um, we're not going to go through these, but we've got a number of players that have managed to progress on. What I also though want to highlight, if I go on to the next stage, is we've got a number of players that have gone on to trials with UK clubs and have come across this barrier. So at the bottom of here, there's, there's three players there at the bottom, two that travelled with Oldham and one that travelled with, with Blackburn Rovers. And they went and they trialled, but the barrier that they came up, across, uh, up against was that um, Article 19 and the visa and the uh, non-EU, that was one of the barriers that they came across. And that is something that has triggered us once again to look at um, this study. <coughs> so finally, we come to our virtual showcase. Um, a number of you have been part of our virtual showcase. And why am I mentioning this now right at the end? Well, we put on our virtual showcase just to be, um, just to assist during this time, during, during the, the pandemic and, and players can't get out on the pitch. Um, so we put on, we've had two virtual showcases, which have been a great success. And we've had players that have gone on to, um, to talking to clubs or looking at the US route from the virtual showcase. What is the virtual showcase? Well, it's where you as a player put together your, uh, your highlights, video, as much information as you can, we put it on a platform and then we share that out. And we share that out not only on our platform, but through uh, Footballers Global, a part of ours, a, a platform that we can put things on. We share it out through Ipso. We share that out through our own direct contacts. Now, this is now going to become more prominent. So whilst we will still do our showcase events um, in the UK, we will continue to have virtual showcase events and platforms where we can send out players' information worldwide and to these type of countries. because that's now going to be the route for many of our international players. And I think there we've come on to the end. We've come on to our um, questions. Um, I've seen one or two questions popping up as we've uh, gone through there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing this screen now. And thank you, everybody, for listening. And hopefully that has, has stimulated some ideas with you. Um, give a little clarity on this because we often speak to players um, who, who don't quite understand this. But we'll take some questions now, and I think Peter's going to take over and lead on that. So I'll stop sharing that so you can all see us. Vic, thank you ever so much. That was really informative. I'm sure that everybody has learned something from that. Um, if not, how to pronounce Cotonou, but we'll work on that one. But thank you ever so much. And, and really, thank you 
Gary and Sam who compiled this report. It was a really brilliant piece of work. So I'm moving into questions. A question's come up. Which is the best country from a non-EU UK player to go to? Where where is the best country? Well, looking at that um, from from the report, and I don't know, Gary, if you could if if, if you could step in as well with that. But um, looking at the reports, we group them into the group one and group two. So you've got Belgium, you've got Denmark, you've got Portugal, you've got Germany. Um, so I would say looking at, at, at those four, um, when we're looking at barriers, and I'm not necessarily looking at what's the best country for football, and what when we're looking at the barriers that come into place for UK and non-EU footballs, they're the best four. They're the ones from the study. Um, and I don't know, Gary, if you, if you agree with that, they're the ones that came out on top there with that study. Yeah, they did very clearly, Mick, really. Um, I think... Um, from an opportunity point of view, I know that um, we've acted for um, young players, not, you know, not hot through you, but, you know, kind of independently who've, um, you know, they found um, that the opportunities available in Denmark were, were particularly good. And I think, you know, the fact that it's an English speaking environment you're working and, uh, you're working and playing in um, was very helpful. Um, you know, to those young players. So, um, yeah, you know, those four, those four countries that you've mentioned. Um, I, I could, I could perhaps just say a little bit about the UK as well. As, as, as um, you know, people will know, the UK is in a kind of a transition period at the moment as it leaves the EU. Um, the the rules, as we all know, for for non-EU um, players or potential players here in the UK are really tough. You know, you've got to be pretty high level, you know, to get a look in. Um, there's, there's been nothing really from, from the FA about kind of lowering those bars, you know, making it more accessible because what, what the F FA needs to remember here is that um, they're, you know, they're no longer going to be able to recruit young, young players from the EU after um, the end of 2020. So, you know, there's going to be, you know, perhaps a dearth or perhaps a lack of young players coming through into the sort of lower leagues, I suspect. And I, my suspicion, although I'm not basing this on any evidence, but my suspicion really is that the FA and, you know, perhaps the UK Home Office as well are going to have to relax things a little bit for, you know, for the UK. So kind of watch this space really and see what see what develops here. Thank you, Gary. That's a really pertinent point. And um, I'm sure that that is something that everybody will follow mm. up with now and keep an eye on. Very good point. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here regarding US scholarships. Um, what's the minimum age required to apply for one of those? Okay, so we can get more more specific and, and if you if there's somebody that's interested in in doing that we can get more specific information but you're talking for the u.s scholarship you are talking um at sort of the a level side so you're looking at uh, when players are, are late 17 18 um for going on to the u.s scholarship however um what quite often happens and we have players that are, are in this system at the moment um what uh I know that, that soccer assists like to do, there's, there's quite a lead in time. So you can't just apply for a US scholarship. So if, you, if you've done your, your, um, your, your, the end of your A-levels and you're looking at going on to university, you can't just go and, right, I want to go and do a US scholarship and, and go in then. That, you've got to apply early on. Um, and that process can take anything from two years, 18 months. Sometimes they can, you know in a year and a bit short they can get it independent on the player but there's a lot of information that, that needs to be gathered for that US scholarship so there'll be highlights reels and in in one of our, our next webinars we talk about putting together a football CV and your highlights reels um, so we've got a number of players that will come on our programs and they might come on a two-year program got some that have been on a three-year program and uh, have that goal of going on to the US so we're already working with um with Soccer Assist and with Tyrell there, to produce all the information that they need, their, their videos, their SATs that they need, their football CV, 
doing some training days um, so that they can they can be seen by the um, coaches from the US colleges. So the, the age wise is once you finish sort of A levels um, and you come in 17, 18, um, that's the age wise to go. Um, however, um, the applying, I would say it's got to be, you know, maximum it's got to be, uh, minimum it's got to be a year before that. So when players are around sort of 16. Great, thanks very much. Um, there's a question. Someone's saying that we didn't mention the Netherlands. We didn't mention Holland. Is there um, is that a good route? Um, I don't know whether we know that off the top of our heads, but um, I can. Pro yeah, I, I have a little bit of knowledge on the Netherlands. Um, it's quite similar to the UK in that um, there's a work permit requirement if you want to um, play professionally in in the Netherlands. Um, so it's quite a challenge um, to get there. Um, I mean, training with a local academy. Um, as long as you're not being paid for doing that, um, that would normally be acceptable, I think. Um, but, you know, that step then from, you know, signing, um, signing terms with, with a club, for example, that's probably going to be um, a bit more difficult, I suspect. Um, I don't think the the Netherlands work permit rules are as kind of high level as ours, um, but they are certainly there so that's why we've we've not kind of singled it out as one of the kind of more um welcoming or friendly friendly countries for footballers from from outside the eu yeah thanks gary i, I guess that's possibly because the the, the person who asked, asked that question may have some contacts in the netherlands it may mm. be they've got some some connection there but thank you for that um the question possibly for you mick uh, does the academy organise regular trials via weekly games? Um, yeah. Could, can scouts come on a weekly basis and watch um, our players? Okay, scouts can come whenever they, they, they want to come, to be fair. Um, so, uh, 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 as a set... Um, now, I'm not going to call them trials. As a set showcase event, we have two showcase events, physical showcases events throughout the year. Um, and to them showcase events, we invite scouts um, from here in the UK and around the world, scouts and club representatives um, to come and watch. Um, I think on the last one, we, we put out something like 83 invites. Now, they don't all come, um, but we do get a, a good stand. We get between 10 and 15 scouts that will come to those, um, those two events. However, scouts can come at any stage through it, or, and club representatives at any stage throughout the season. And sometimes that can be in in the manner of the visiting coaches, um, the, the visiting team's coach can quite often be a scout. And, and you know, we're about trying to progress players on, and if we can, we you know we we will talk to them about that. Um, that so last season, like with one of the players, I think one of the Bolton Wanderers coaches was watching because his player his team was playing and he identified one of our players yeah. so so it does and, and as we go through we i mean also we film all the games uh, well when i say all the game we film as many of the games as we can so that footage um is something that i know pete you and me use for social media and we used to get out there and, and and you know if there's something specific we can put on there so that's constantly being being put in the forefront of um, club representatives and scouts as well. Yeah, and I think um, you can see you can see on our website there's lots of evidence of how we use the the VEO camera for players. Uh, it's a really smart tool and allows players to identify um, parts of play that they're involved in, and then they can um, upload that. It's also used by our coaches to um, for post match analysis. So. That's good. Someone's asking about France, particularly. Um, how friendly or otherwise is France? Maybe, Gary, you've got an insight. In yeah, so France doesn't have a work permit restriction, but it restricts foreign players in another way in that it's got a very severe cap on the number of players um, who are allowed in a club. The cap is four, and also in the starting 11, it's four maximum uh, foreign players as well. So that kind of logically leads clubs in France um, to, you know, to be very um, selective about recruiting foreign players. You know, they only, you know, will really look at 
you know the top uh, the top players in that you know for their league. Mm. Right, brilliant. Thank you. There's a question. Um, are there any residential academies in Denmark that take international players who are under eighteen? Do we know? Um, I, I don't, uh, if I'm being honest, no, I, I don't That's know. That. I don't know. It was quite interesting to, you know, the, the quote that you used in the presentation, Mick, uh, from Jordan Gardner at Helsingor, you know, they're obviously very, very keen to encourage um, that kind of ethos at their club. And um, it wouldn't certainly, I mean, I'd, you know, we could look into it, I suppose, but it wouldn't surprise me if there's, um, you know, particular facilities or options, you know, for, um, you know, for younger players, you know, to go over to Denmark and to join a club like Helsingor. Mm. Yeah. And I think um, we can follow up with the question of that. That's fine. Mm. No problem at all. Um, any educational requirements for soccer assist scholarships? Nick. Yeah, um, the, the there are educational requirements. So, for example, um, uh, I know that the players that were with us uh, studying the BTEC route had to um, pass the BTEC uh, diploma. Um, and depending on the level of the education, um, will also depend on what university or what college you can you can get offers at. Uh, when you go to the US. Um, so you do need to have done that level three, so that is either BTEC or possibly A-levels um, to be able to progress on um, to go to the US, or it might be the equivalent in your own country. Um, now, when just going back to the age side of things that we were talking about, we talked about the minimum, but in actual fact, I know that they do take players that are older, so they're 19, 20, to go on onto there as well. Um, so the, the maximum side of things, there is quite an age range there. Great stuff. Thank you. But I do know uh, something that's in line with our own ethos is that to, to get a scholarship at a good US university, then you have to be able to demonstrate that you are as good academically as you are on the pitch. I think that's mm. right to say. There's um, an Indian player who is age 15 and he's asking about what opportunities would there be for Indian players to have a trial. Um, he's asking how could he join our academy? Well, I'll answer that first if you don't mind, Mick, because that's an important question. Because you're 15, um, I would advise you immediately to discuss this with your parents. And if you could ask your parents to contact us and then we'll discuss that with them. So that's the best answer I can give there about joining uh, our academy. Yeah, and uh, I think as for signing on for, you know, uh, do we say an Indian player? Yes. Them, right? So I think it is just following that route. And I think, especially at the age of 15, to be able to, to have some training and education under your belt and, and, and show that with um, dedication of, of doing an academy like ours or similar or, or back back home and working hard then looking at those countries that we were talking about um those player friendly countries when you're at that older age to be able to to progress on and and try and be scouted by them great okay um there's a question here about attending university and then playing at the same time playing for a club in a one of the group one countries i don't know if anybody knows about that particularly, but I guess if if a, if the um, if, if the regime allows them to work as a professional player, then it ought not to bar them from studying full time at university. I don't know if anyone's got any extra insight on that. Um, I don't know from from a, a visa visa point of view and a study visa or, or study permit and and work permit. I don't know how that would work. I think um, from a point of view of of playing alongside university alongside study um, and and playing you know training full time um, and playing um, at, at university. I think the US is the best route for that because I don't think there's many other places in the world, especially like here in the UK. Universities might have a university team, 
but that's um, a Wednesday afternoon of a team they might train once a week. They don't necessarily train on a daily basis like they do in the US and play. Um, the structure for university training in the US is, is probably one of the best uh, side of things. I think if you're going to be going to one of those Group 1 countries, you would be piecing together, here's your university, and then if you're, like Pete says, if the re regime allows you to go and train with a club, then you do that as a, as a separate. But then it's looking at whether um, any entry visas and permits are, are, are permitted. And Gary, I don't know if you know anything with regards to that. Um, nothing really to add to that, that. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no problem at all. I think it, it's, it's a very good question because it makes me think that there must be some case studies that we could uh, try and find of players who have been studying at university in those group one countries. So uh, thanks for that question. So let me see. Uh, there's somebody asking about agents, football agents, and I think it's always good to get a responsible answer about that because they're asking, is it good to get, um, to engage an agent to help you? Um, from an agent, from a point of view, it, it, it all depends on, on the age of, of that player and it all depends on the different ages. There are some really good agents that are out there that can help and support players. But there are some agents out there that will charge um, without the ability to be able to help and progress players on. Um, so it's a difficult one. It all depends on the agents. It all depends on the players and where you're looking at. Um, uh, I would say always try, if, if you are looking at engaging an agent and you're on you know, an academy, if you're with us or you're with, um, with another academy or you're with a team somewhere, I'd, I'd say always try and, and gain advice from whoever's coaching you and, and leading you and, and stuff uh, with regards to that, because that can be sometimes having an agent, especially at a, and this is, this is some of the experience that I've had, um, especially at a young, young age can be a barrier into getting into clubs because quite often clubs may look at it and think, well, I don't, why do you need an agent at that age? You're not, if you're not at a club, if you're not at a pro level and you're moving around clubs and you need somebody to represent you, well, why do you need an agent when we're a club who could come and send a scout and could come and find you and, and bring you in? Uh, we have had experiences of where an agent has been a barrier for, um, for players to get in. And some academies, I know here in the UK, and I know we're, not, we're, we're sort of talking about around the world, but some academies here in the UK for... Um, young players, so you're under 18 and that won't deal with agents because they don't think at that age they need to deal with agents. So it can be a good thing, especially for, for older players who, if you've had a, um, a semi-professional career in football, you've played at a good level, you need an agent to try and help you and, and open doors for you, that can be good. I think at a younger age, I'd be very careful with an agent. Okay. Um, Gary, this one's possibly for, for you for an initial response. It, it may be uh, something to follow up on. Um, but one of the questioners here is saying that his son has moved to the UK as his dependent. And he's saying that according to Article 19 of the FA regulations, he's an exception to the rule. Does this mean that he's free to join pro teams? And there are no restrictions. I think there's a lot of detail missing. It's a good question. Um, I think, I mean, so the Article 19 exemption applies where somebody's coming here for, the, for purposes of education, but this lad's not for the purpose of education. He's your dependent, isn't he? Um, so I'd need to look into that. I think from, um, from the point of view of, um, you know, the UK's rules on... Um, what an immigrant can do in the UK, um, your son would probably be okay, you know, because he's here as a dependent, there's no restriction on activity. So it can be study or work. Um, um, so potentially I think, yeah, the, the answer is yes. You know, he would be able to, um, you know, to join a pro team if, um, you know, if that were his um, kind of wish and he got taken on by somebody. So, yeah, I think probably the answer is yes, but I would want to, to do a bit more research before I give you a definite answer, I think, to that. Thanks, Gary. I think um, to the questioner there, if you want to contact us, and you can contact Gary also directly, um, 
the Latitude Law website address is at the end of this presentation. But Gary, if I remember, it's latitudelaw.com. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So that's probably um, the best way to get a definitive answer on that one. Okay. I've got a um, question here from a parent who'd sent their son to IHM Football Academy at um, one of the independent schools that we work with. He's now going to a UK university and he's asking, what are the chances of progression in football in the UK? And he'd, I think he's indicating that he'd had interest from a non-league club whilst he was in the UK. Um, well, I think uh, from a non-league side of things, the, the, there would be opportunities. So if he's studying at a university uh, here in the UK, um, it would be to check um, check any restrictions on, I would imagine it would be on a tier four visa and check any restrictions. Mm. There are um, obviously players that have in the past played um, at the very non you know, lower league side of things. I don't know, um, Gary, if you've got anything more to, to, to add with regards to that at the university level. Yeah, I think so. On a tier four visa at university level, you're subject to a 20 hour a week uh, maximum um, work time um, during term. Um, that limit goes in vacation time. So, the, you know, the individual could potentially play full time for a club during um you know during the holidays um but um i mean this is one of the real problems we have you know problems that young players have you know when there's interest from a non-league um from non-league club and um you know they might want to offer terms to a young player that you know the work permit rules that we have here they don't general they're not generally very helpful you know they don't allow you to um you know to work um the maximum on tier four for like below degree level is 10 hours and if you're here on a on a short-term study visa you can't work at all so you know we are quite restrictive here in the uk unfortunately am i right gary just to add to that the term working um is classed as either paid or on unpaid voluntary or or non that you know, even if these players are going to say, well, I'm not being paid, quite often yeah. that still can be a bad Exactly. Idea. Yeah, yeah. They are still caught by that, um, by that rule. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, everybody. That seems to be the, um, the last of our questions. I think we've managed to answer all of them. I think the only outstanding questions are coming from people quite specific about education and um, our academy so please do contact us uh, with any questions that you might have following up regarding either uh, any legal issues that you would like um, help with or if you've got any inquiries about how to uh, apply for for the uh, the academy that we run in Manchester we do work with two independent schools and they range from age 11 through to 18, 19. So GCSEs through to A-levels, foundation program for international students and international baccalaureate. So there's a very wide range. And as I say, the, our principal aim is to keep all of our players in full-time education and everybody is working towards a plan B. Football might be your dream, but everybody needs a plan B, every player does. And that's, that's what we try and do. So Gary, thanks ever so much for your time and for, uh, to Sam for his marvelous report there. Uh, Mick, thank you very much for an informative talk. And um, everybody, we'll be making this recording available for you to see online. So thank you ever so much and speak to you all soon.